Cheryl, we arranged an unusual morning laziness. The children went to her parents for the weekend. This evening, we were going to an award ceremony at a local hotel where she was supposed to be awarded something, but they didn't say what it was. This gave her time to prepare a short acceptance speech. She looked at me from her side of the bed, lying on her side. She was beautiful. You know that I love you, right? Why was this a question? It seemed to me that she had done or was about to do something that I would not like. The last couple of months have been cool between us. We made love last night, but I felt like it might be the last time for her. Perhaps this is true. Actually, I'm not sure anymore. For the last two years, you've been so engrossed in your work most of the time, and for the last few months, it's like the kids and I don't even exist. I'm just a housekeeper and cook for you. Sorry, darling, this will end soon. I don't believe that either, you keep saying that. I warned you. She extended her hand to me, but I got out of bed before she could touch me. I looked at her and said, You can save our marriage, it all depends on you. How? It depends only on you. If I keep telling you what you're doing wrong, you'll never learn and you'll end up blaming me for nagging you. I would never do this to you. You forget how long I've known you. If I keep telling you what to do, you'll soon start accusing me of trying to control you. You need to figure out for yourself what's wrong. Is it because I work too much? Everything is for us, for the sake of the children and our dreams. I'm here every weekend, no business on weekends we have a rule. I comply with it. She really complied. It's strange, but I don't. Marriage is a seven-day affair, not just a weekend. And it's not that you work too much. I headed to the shower and heard her quietly sobbing. I had just adjusted the water in the shower to the desired temperature when she walked in on me. Her eyes were red and she was crying. I hugged her. I wanted to help her, but she had to figure it out on her own. We got out of the shower and dried each other off. Everything was very quiet. Almost nothing was said. We both got dressed and had breakfast. I went to my home office to finish the report. She went about her household chores unloaded the dishwasher, vacuumed, did laundry, dusted, things like that. She prepared dinner. Without the children, everything was quite calm. After lunch, she said that she needed to go to the hotel to help with the preparations for the ceremony. I looked at her. Give my regards to Gerald. It was her boss, and it seemed to me that he was the problem. He won't be there. I looked at her with the expression, Come on, really? She looked down. I returned to the office and my report was ready. All that remained was to send it for expert verification. I quickly read it out loud and hit the send button. I had a few more things to do to prepare for the ceremony and then I wondered how we got to this point. I met Cheryl, the woman who would later become my wife, at a job fair. The aerospace company I worked for was every student's dream. I was used as a shining example of what is available to young people in this industry. She represented her university, showing what you could get there. She was pretty and looked smart. The university did not send any stunning beauty to this event. This would probably only scare people away or create the wrong impression. We met at the coffee machine. I walked up first, but she looked a little exhausted, so I let her go ahead. A real gentleman, she said. I try to be like that, and sometimes I succeed. This time you did it, she answered with a smile. An hour or so later, I saw her heading towards the coffee machine again. This time I followed her, but now she let me go ahead. We started talking about training, university versus apprenticeship. I cheekily asked if she would like to continue the conversation over drinks that evening. She agreed. We spent the evening talking, not just about education, we found out that we come from neighboring cities and have a lot in common. She kissed me on the cheek when we parted. I learned that her university was about a hundred miles from home. This discouraged me from hoping for anything more. It was a pity. We did not exchange phone numbers, and as it seemed to me, we parted as friends the next day. A couple of days after returning to work, my mentor told me that a young woman had called the apprenticeship center. He gave me her phone number. This got me thinking about the possibility of a long-distance relationship. In a university full of young and attractive students, I, a simple aircraft technician, 
or rather, not even a technician yet, but a student, felt insecure. But fate intervened before I could decide whether to call her or not. Two weeks later, we met again at a job fair. As soon as she saw me, she immediately came up and said in a dissatisfied tone, Why didn't you call me? I explained that I didn't think a relationship could work at that distance. Is this your excuse? But in reality, you don't love me. No, on the contrary, I like you too much, I replied. This stopped her. I explained my reasons, talked about her promising studies at the Faculty of Management and Psychology, and that she was surrounded by beautiful young students, and I was just a wrench, and I had not yet completed my training. I revealed my doubts to her. I don't want to get my heart broken. She stroked my face and said, I would never do this to you. This was the first night we spent together. I graduated and we got married while she was still at university. With the help of our parents, we were able to arrange life so that she could complete her studies. I visited her almost every weekend in my old Ford Fiesta. It's good that I was a technician and could keep it in working order. My salary was small, but since I lived with my parents and worked as much overtime as possible, I was able to save up for a down payment on the small apartment we were looking for. Cheryl's graduation was the proudest day of my life. It overshadowed my modest achievements finishing my studies as a technician. She graduated with honors in two disciplines. We moved into our small apartment and then real life began. She couldn't find a job that matched her degrees. The best she managed to find was a position as a manager in a shoe store. I hugged her when she cried at night because after three years of studying, she was just selling shoes. Nobody wanted to hire a manager without experience. We looked for jobs everywhere within a 30-mile radius. I took days off to take her to interviews. She got good reviews, but no work. I used these trips to teach her to drive. It cost me the transmission once when it forgot what the clutch pedal was for. No problem, used transmissions are easy to find on eBay. It was a cold and wet job, but I made it through because she had an interview the next day. She expressed her gratitude in her heart in the most fantastic way. One day she returned home happy. She had managed to handle a difficult client and turn it into a teaching moment for the salesperson. A client who observed this offered Cheryl a job at her accounting firm as an assistant manager. Things got better. After 18 months, she was earning the same as me without overtime. We were able to start saving money, and then we had a plan. We both love to travel, but we haven't had much opportunity to do so lately. So we decided that when she turned 55, a year later than me, we would save enough money and investments to quit our jobs, buy a caravan or motorhome with a small car trailer and travel around Europe, spending winters on the Mediterranean coast. We wanted to travel while we were still young and healthy enough to enjoy it. All my overtime and experience gained was noticed by my superiors, and I was transferred to the testing department, where we tested new systems for aircraft. We wrote testing procedures, ran tests, evaluated results, and wrote reports. It was an amazing job, I loved it, and it came with a significant pay increase. But thanks to Cheryl's promotions, her income already exceeded mine. After about 18 months at the new job, we had a small glitch. She became pregnant. I don't understand how this happened. Well, in general, it's clear how, but we used protection. We discussed this at length with both of our families, and with their support, we decided that Cheryl would have better earning power in the long run. In the engineering industry, careers rarely progress quickly. The next promotion could have to wait years. My work was interesting, and people usually stayed in their positions until retirement. In Cheryl's field, staff turnover was much higher. So I became a stay-at-home mom and started raising our son Derek. At the same time, I continued to write procedures and reports for the company. When I needed to travel for tests, my grandparents took care of the child. My job has allowed me to do this. A year later, we had Susie, and now I was taking care of two children. At that point, the company allowed me to focus entirely on the written work, without any physical testing. This upset me because testing was the most interesting part of my job, but now it would be too difficult for grandparents with two babies. I did most of the housework, cooking, 
taking care of the children and doing reports. Our savings and investments gradually grew, although we had to cut back on expenses when Susie arrived. We moved from an apartment to a small house because our previous housing became too small for us. We made small changes to the new house. I set up an office on the first floor, and a large shower was installed in the bathroom. Although we were a little behind our financial goals, we decided that we could buy a simpler motorhome or a used one. While on maternity leave with Susie, Cheryl decided it was time to change jobs. She reviewed all of her company's options and found an opening at an advertising agency. She quickly got used to it and began to show excellent results. Her skills in selecting people for the right advertising campaigns allowed her to rapidly advance through her career. She was promoted very quickly. By that time, I had already left my company and began working on a contract basis, most often for my own former company and sometimes for others. I also occasionally performed estimates and wrote reports for Cheryl's firm. This job gave me flexibility in caring for children and managing the home. Life was good. Cheryl cleaned the house on the weekends, so I didn't have much cleaning to do during the week. Most of the laundry was also done on the weekends, so I always had clean clothes for the kids. We laughed a lot and loved each other. If we didn't reach our goal of 55, it didn't bother us because our lives were filled with joy. In my opinion, Cheryl only became more beautiful with age. Her figure was rounded in the right places, she dressed stylishly and gained confidence. She was a real beauty and I enjoyed all the benefits of it. I was in shape too, constantly running after the kids, sometimes running five miles a couple of times a week, plus eating right all helped. Two years ago, Cheryl was promoted again. Her salary was much higher than mine. We invested all excess into a general investment account. Thanks to my experience in stock trading and contract work, I worked part-time to save up for a larger motorhome. But that's when Gerald showed up, and everything changed. Since Gerald's arrival at work, Cheryl has had more responsibilities, more hours, more pressure. Sometimes, when she returned home, she was so tired that she could not do anything, and meetings outside the office began to happen more and more often. In the past, clients would come to their office to use their presentation technology. Now, Cheryl said, Gerald preferred to travel to clients. She kept talking about how good he is, how smart he is, how he helps her. I told her that she was too attached to him and that this could lead to something that would harm our marriage. She took my words as a hint of a possible romance and replied that I had nothing to worry about. She stroked my face, as she had done many years ago, and said, I will never do this to you, darling. After that she talked less about Gerald, but I was still worried. She still didn't work on weekends, but she didn't even have enough energy to help with the cleaning, so I began to take on most of the household responsibilities. We continued to discuss our plans and leaf through magazines about mobile homes. But a couple of months ago something changed. It was almost imperceptible, but I felt it. The bedroom became colder, and sometimes on the contrary too hot, as if it was guilt sex. I had a feeling that something had happened. After her last promotion, we began to be invited to events for the company's management. We also went to corporate picnics, where all employees and their families were invited. At such meetings, I was usually perceived simply as a housekeeper and father of children. Most often they ignored me because I didn't earn as much as they did. Although by this time Derek and Susie had already started school, and I had returned to contract physics testing, Cheryl's colleagues did not know what I was doing. They thought I was just a housewife who earned a little extra money by writing reports. I told Cheryl that I felt uncomfortable at these events because I was ignored. She said I was exaggerating. I warned her that her excessive focus on work and co-workers rather than family was harming our marriage. I didn't like being left out as if I was some kind of stranger. I wondered if this had anything to do with Gerald. I told her that she had to choose between work and family. To this, she stroked my face again and said, You and the children always come first, dear. I didn't answer. She insisted that she was doing everything for us and reminded us that our goal was only 13 years away. The children may be married by then, 
or will be able to take care of the house themselves, and we will be traveling around Europe. My suspicions made me pay more attention. It is a professional habit of a test engineer to expect that something can go wrong. I looked for signs, but found nothing concrete. There was no sign of any rush in the shower when she came home. Sometimes I would come to her work for lunch unannounced, and she always made time for me, although sometimes I had to wait a little. She still didn't work on Sundays and insisted that she never went on business trips on the weekends because it was our family time. Several times I came to hotels where she was supposedly at a meeting. I wanted to see what was happening. I didn't notice anything suspicious. One day I deliberately left my phone at home and monitored her movements. But despite my suspicions, I never found evidence. I tried to ask her why meetings with clients were often arranged at the last minute. She gave evasive answers, and I didn't like it. One day, I unexpectedly showed up at the hotel where Gerald was also staying. I watched them for a while before making my presence known. I didn't see anything suspicious. Still, the feeling of anxiety did not leave me. She talked about Gerald as if she admired him more and more, and I felt that I was in the background. When I told her how I felt, she accused me of not trusting me. The coldness of the sex hurt. It seemed like it was just something she had to do. There was no love in this. She told me that she was tired from work, but asked not to worry. All this was for our sake. And then she was hot, like in the early days of our relationship, even hotter because we already knew what each other liked. One day she surprised me by calling me upstairs. She stood at the top of the stairs in her purple vintage-style Axford corset, stockings, 12 centimeters heels, and leather gloves that reached to her elbows. She was holding our white bondage rope in her hands. Darling, I have a surprise for you. I think you know what to do with this, she said, handing me the rope. Thank you, honey, I needed that. But somehow it felt as if sex was to blame. Did she want to atone for some guilt or be punished? Or am I overthinking things? Back in the present, I thought about tonight. It was an awards ceremony, but I had a feeling it would be different. She was supposed to be rewarded for her success in the company and at the same time announced her promotion. These details have already leaked. But something has changed. One day I stopped by to pick her up for lunch. I arranged this in advance so that she would be waiting for me. I was waiting for her at the reception and received a message that she would be down soon. While I was waiting, I was looking through a magazine and came across some interesting photographs. Around the time her behavior changed, she was at an advertising industry conference a couple of months ago. There was a magazine that covered the event. There were people in the photographs that I recognized. I took the magazine home. The next day, when she left for work, I had time to study the magazine and photographs more closely. In them she was not the center of attention, but in the background. I saw her holding Gerald's hand across the table. In another photo, they danced close to each other, his hands on her buttocks and her head resting on his shoulder. And finally, in one photo, they were walking down the corridor arm in arm. This one especially angered me. I was told that I could not go to this event because spouses were not allowed there. However, in several photographs, including the main ones, it was obvious that the couple were present. With the pictures and the lies, I was mad as hell, and it couldn't go on any longer. Tonight was supposed to be the moment of truth. She returned from the hotel, and I put on a brave face. My tuxedo was already ready. I took a shower, shaved, and waited for her. Is everything prepared? I asked. Yes, everything is fine. We just have to come. Was Gerald there? Um, yeah, he was just checking everything. Did you give him my regards? Yes, I did. Why are you asking? What did he say when you said my regards? She looked at me with bewilderment. Nothing, what? I ignored her question. She didn't seem to understand anything. I was waiting for her downstairs. She came down and looked amazing. I don't know how she managed to get ready so quickly. Do you have a thank you speech ready? I asked. Oh, hell no, she's still upstairs. Don't worry, I'll bring it. I don't want you running up the stairs in those heels. She looked a little worried. Please don't read it. I want it to be a surprise. I've already read it. 
The speech included thanks to the team and mentions of exceptional employees, but the last line alerted me, thanks to him. Who did she mean, me or Gerald? In any case, there will be a surprise. While I was upstairs, I checked that all the envelopes and documents were in place, hoping they would come home so I could tear them up. The taxi arrived on time, but the atmosphere in the car was cold. We were both silent, lost in our thoughts. When we entered the hall, Gerald was there. He extended his hand, I shook it, and we exchanged routine greetings. He then took Cheryl by the arm and walked her to the table. I followed. I noticed how people were looking at me. I think some of them felt that this could be an interesting evening. When we got to the table, I tried to push him out so I could pull out a chair for Cheryl. Leaning towards her ear, I whispered, You have one chance. I'm not sure if she heard. We sat down at the table. I ended up next to Cheryl, and Gerald was on her other side. Next to him sat his wife, a slightly plump, rustic woman in a bright red dress. It seemed to me that she was as unhappy as I was, but she was doing her duty. On the other side of me sat the wife of another manager, who, having learned that I was writing reports on aircraft testing, simply ignored me. The dinner was delicious, but lonely. Cheryl spent most of the time talking to Gerald. It was clear to everyone around the table that I was being ignored. The awards part of the evening arrived. The closer her turn came, the more excited she became. When she wasn't called fourth or third, I saw her grab Gerald's hand. Then I looked at my friend standing across the hall. He had two envelopes in his pocket, one yellow, the other red. He knew what to do. Finally, second place was announced, and it became obvious that she had taken first. Her name sounded, and I saw how she collected herself, smiled at me, and stood up. She walked up to the stage and to the microphone. For some reason, Gerald followed her. She accepted the award, addressed the crowd, and said, This award is not only for me, but for my entire team, Jules, my irreplaceable right-hand woman, Frank and Harry with their great ideas, and Geraldine, who brings them to life. The first toast is at my expense, someone shouted from the audience. We couldn't have done this without your help, boss, she smiled and continued. And I couldn't have achieved this without the help of one person who is very dear to me. I started to worry. She pointed to Gerald next to her. Without his help, I would not have achieved half of what I have achieved. That's it. The decision has been made. She chose Gerald and her career over me and our children. I was really pissed off, remembering all the crap I had been putting up with for the last 14 years. She chose him over me. Even on stage, she thanked him, and not the husband with whom she lived for so many years. I decided it was time to act. She thanked him, smiled at the audience, holding the check and award in her hands, and together with Gerald headed towards the stairs leading from the stage. But I stood up and began to clap my hands slowly, loudly, and rhythmically. She looked at me in complete shock, as if she had forgotten that I was even there. Gerald simply smiled. My friend across the hall picked up a yellow envelope. I nodded to him. He walked up to the stage and handed the envelope to Cheryl. His voice came loud and clear. Your husband asked me to give this to you. I thought she was going to faint. There was dead silence in the room as she opened the envelope. Of course, there were divorce papers inside. It also included an accusation of adultery, although I had no direct evidence. I took out the small envelope I had with me and handed it to Gerald's wife. You might be interested in looking at these photographs, I said. I then walked to the table where the CEO of the company was sitting with his family and colleagues. I took out the enlarged photographs and threw them in front of him so that he could see my wife dancing with Gerald, his hands on her buttocks, them holding hands and walking arm in arm down the hallway. I also placed another envelope in front of him. Turning to the crowd, I said loudly, If you don't know who I am, then it's not surprising, because I'm never introduced. I am the husband, but most of you probably didn't even know about it. You probably also didn't know that I am babysitting our two children so she can work for you. You probably didn't know that I supported and loved her when she couldn't find a job in her field and sold shoes for a year. I spent hours fixing our car so she could drive to interviews. 
I taught her to drive. I quit my job, which I loved, so she could pursue her dreams. I clean, cook, change dirty diapers, and have not received a word of gratitude for 14 years of support. I pointed to Gerald. And this guy, this late night, gets all the recognition. I waved my hand around the room to point to everyone present. And you all ignore me. Well, the next time you board a plane for a vacation or business trip, think about those like me who are doing everything to keep that plane from falling out of the sky. I don't make much money, but I help keep you safe. There was tense silence in the hall. Cheryl, standing on stage, looked at me. Please, dear, not here. Why not? You humiliated me in front of all these people so many times that I lost count. The only time you spoke to me today was to say, pass the pepper. You didn't even ask, you just said it. At company events, you completely ignore me, spend the entire time with the team and your boss, and then I just take you home. Everyone sees how you treat me. Well, that's enough. She cried, her makeup ran. Please, dear, I will fix everything. Remember when we met for the second time, I said that I didn't want to start a relationship because I couldn't stand it when my heart was broken. You then stroked my face and said, I will never do this to you. I paused, then added, but you still did it. You almost broke my heart when I saw pictures of you holding his hand and dancing with him. Perhaps there was an explanation for this, but what completely broke my heart was that you put him above me by standing here and telling all these people, including me, that he is more important to you than your husband of 14 years. She continued to cry. So I'm taking my broken heart home to start a new life, I said. Oh yes, next week you will have to find a nanny so that you can go to work. I turned to the crowd. Now, if you don't mind, I need to go and start a new life. I really need a drink. I headed towards the bar. There was dead silence in the hall, broken only by Cheryl's sobs. She made her choice, she was given a chance, but she missed it. If she had at least acknowledged me and not just Gerald, I would have given her another envelope. Even if she mentioned both of us, I would accept it. At the bar, I ordered a large vodka tonic and one ice cube. Most of the drink disappeared almost immediately. Looking up at the stage, I saw Gerald hugging Cheryl as she cried. I shouted from the bar. Well, don't they look cozy up there together? The next thing I saw was a lady in a red dress, Gerald's wife, fly up onto the stage and hit him with her bag. Gerald collapsed as if there was a brick in his bag. Then, out of the blue, the CEO approached me. I didn't expect it so quickly probably on Monday or Tuesday, but not now. He was holding papers from an envelope that mentioned toxic work environment, sexual harassment, negligence, and even the American term interference in family life. All the accusations were fictitious, but I didn't care. I wanted to scare them. My lawyer warned that all this would not be cheap. I assured him that once the house was sold, I would be able to pay for his services. He also mentioned that Cheryl will likely get custody of the children. But I replied that I would fight for it because I was the primary caregiver. Well, taking care of two children will probably hurt her career, I said. Let her now take on this responsibility. The lawyer said that given my status as the primary caregiver, I should be given good visitation rights. The CEO looked upset and asked, What can we do to fix this? His words sounded like he was asking how much money it would take to stop this. I replied, Money won't help here. You allowed these two to enter into a relationship, perhaps right in the office or in the hotel that you paid for. I'm not sure where I stand legally yet, but Cheryl will soon find herself with two children in her arms. Hopefully you have some kind of daycare or flexible work hours. He tried to explain. No, no, I'm not talking about money. What can I do to stop this? Why are you asking me how to fix this? This is your company and it should be your decision, not mine. If I tell you what to do and you do it and everything goes wrong, you can place some of the blame on me. So no, you come up with a solution and if it suits me, my claim can disappear. If not, get ready to see it in your local newspaper. I glanced at the scene where Gerald's wife, a petite lady in red, was screaming at him and Cheryl. My wife was sobbing. It seemed like she was about to faint. 
I drank some more vodka and headed towards the stage. A tense silence hung in the hall again. When I reached the edge of the stage, Cheryl looked at me. If you look at the documents, I told her, there is a restraining order that prohibits you from coming within 500 meters of me and the house. I advise you to call your parents or sister, or maybe stay here. But I warn you, if I find out that you are sleeping with another man before the divorce is final, I will extract every penny I can from you. You make twice as much as me, so you'll be paying child support. These were almost empty threats, but I wanted her to worry. Getting this warrant was not easy, but my lawyer did it. That's all, I added and headed towards the exit. The CEO caught up with me at the door along with another man who looked like a typical lawyer. He extended his hand. I'm Philip Wilkinson, corporate lawyer for the company. Can we meet you tomorrow? I was not rude. I shook his hand and answered. No, if you want to talk, contact my lawyer. Cheryl knows how to contact him. With these words, I left. It was a cold taxi ride home. On the way, my friend, who handed over the yellow envelope, came up to me and gave me the red one. I thanked him, and we both left the hotel feeling a little sad. The next day was Sunday, and I decided it was time to start getting the house in order to sell. I had to pick up the children from their grandparents and tell them what was happening. This was important because I was divorcing their daughter. My phone rang several times. These were calls from Cheryl's parents. Apparently, they heard the news. I ignored them. I agreed to pick up the kids at four o'clock, so I started painting the front door. We should have replaced it with a PVC door a long time ago, but I never got around to it. I heard a car drive up, but I didn't turn around. I heard doors slamming, and not just one or two. There was a hum sound from behind. I turned around. The general director stood there, Philip the lawyer, and behind them my wife and her boyfriend. Oh great, now they've come to trample on my feelings. Harold, can we talk? Can you figure it out? Philip began. Taking a closer look, I noticed that they all looked a little worse for wear, with the exception of Gerald, who looked fresh except for the bruise on his face. I stopped, looked at them and said, Okay, I'm listening. You have two minutes. And then I called the police because she couldn't be within 500 meters of me. And you brought her and her boyfriend in to spite me. So I guess it's not going to be good, is it? They didn't seem to see the situation from my side. The wife and Gerald immediately took a step away from each other. You have a minute and a half left, I added, taking out my phone. The lawyer spoke. We think we can work things out if you give us a chance. This can lead to a significant increase in salary for your wife, and we will find a job for you on favorable terms. This will include health and life insurance. We would like you to make peace with your wife and stop the lawsuit. Would you like to consider this proposal? By my calculations, about two minutes have already passed. So you want to bribe me? Is this your decision? No, he answered. Not really. We simply acknowledge the situation that may have developed and think about how to fix it. He especially emphasized the word, possibly. I pointed to my wife and Gerald standing behind me. Will they still work together? Yes, they are a team, and now they are conducting important contract negotiations. Then you have my answer. With these words, I turned around, went into the house, and slammed the door. I went to the window. You must remember to open the door before the paint dries and seals it tightly. Philip's jaw dropped. He was a corporate lawyer and didn't have to deal with situations like this. They should probably hire a family lawyer. I took out my phone and took pictures of them all, including my wife and her boyfriend, who were closer than 500 meters to me. It was also recorded on a security camera, including audio. Halfway down the path, Cheryl turned and walked back, she looked up at the camera. She knew she was recording sound. I told them it wouldn't work. You have too many principles to accept a bribe. I love you and I made a mistake. Sorry, she said, then returned to the car and sat in the front seat next to the CEO. I went to pick up the children. Cheryl's mother was crying and her father looked upset. We didn't talk much, but they said she spent the night with them. I asked where she was now. They didn't know but they assumed she was at work, trying to sort things out, 
and knew I was coming, so she had to be 500 meters from the house. The children were a little confused. I told them that my mom and I had a little fight. Susie asked if we were going to get a divorce. She had seen this happen to many of her friends at school. I didn't embellish the truth. He said that maybe, I don't know for sure yet. I was almost sure that everything would be decided over the next week one way or another. She still had a chance to make things right, but she had to find it herself. At one o'clock on Monday, the phone rang. It was my lawyer. Harold, will you be able to meet the other party at four o'clock today? It's fast. Have they made it clear what they want to talk about? They say they have an alternative solution after visiting your house yesterday. They seem worried. Okay, I'll be there. What should I do if my wife violated a restraining order? I will report this to the court and record it. Do you have proof? Yes, I have videos and photographs. Great, then see you at four. Bring all evidence with you. I arrived early so my lawyer could tell me what to say and, more importantly, what not to say. It might not help, but at least it will give me a chance. The problem was that I had no proof that he and Gerald actually had sex. But it pissed me off that I was ignored for years, and with the appearance of this idiot, it became even worse. We had a great life until he came along, and they started working on this project together. My lawyer asked me what exactly I wanted to achieve. I explained that I wanted the company to feel the consequences, but I didn't want to cause any real harm. A lot of people worked there, and the money it brought in was important to the city. I wanted to give my wife a chance to heal the damage she had done. If she didn't do it, I wanted a divorce. I was ready to leave the children to her, but I wanted to achieve the best possible visitation rights. She could buy my half of the house. We would split investment accounts and savings in half. I haven't mentioned the money I made in the stock market. No one knew about it. We were walking towards the conference room when my lawyer received a message from his secretary that the other party was already here and she placed them in the room. As we walked down the hallway, I noticed Gerald sitting outside. What the hell is he doing here? He looked unhappy and looked at me angrily. We sat down at the table and my lawyer addressed the other side. You have scheduled this meeting, please start. Philip said, We have developed a solution that, as it seems to us, can suit you, so that everything can be settled and you can make peace with your wife. We believe that our offer of employment and a salary increase for your wife may have been the wrong approach. Once the contract is signed for the project Gerald and your wife are working on, we will transfer Gerald to another department. Let's face it, this was already the plan so that he could gain more experience working with the company. We just sped up the process by a few months. Your wife will get Gerald's job. This was also planned, but was moved to an earlier date. Her current promotion was a step in preparation for this position. Will this suit you? I noticed that he kept calling Cheryl your wife without using her name. I looked at my lawyer and he said, The decision is yours. I looked at the three people on the opposite side of the table. I need to think, but most likely not. Cheaters will still remain unpunished and, moreover, will receive a reward in the form of a promotion. The humiliation I felt because of them has not gone away, but I understand the importance of this project for many employees of your company, so maybe I'll make an exception for the company, but I still intend to continue the divorce from my wife. She hasn't shown me any respect, love, or warmth in the last two years since he showed up. I pointed to the door. I'm not going to play second fiddle either for the company or for anyone. So yes, maybe this will allow me to drop the charges against the company. I need to consult and think about it, but I will continue with the divorce. Cheryl sat crying. She seemed to have more than one scarf. She raised her hand like a child at school. Can you tell me something? I nodded. I never cheated on you with Gerald or anyone else. Please, my love, I didn't cheat on you. Yes, she cheated, perhaps not physically, but emotionally. How do you think I feel seeing those pictures of you holding hands, dancing, his hands on your ass, and you also walk hand in hand to the numbers? If I remember correctly, I wanted to go to that conference with you and make it a weekend, but you said spouses weren't allowed. I saw in the photographs that there were spouses there. 
So again, you excluded me, disrespected me, ignored me and my feelings. I think it's time for me to start a new life. Now it's your turn to take care of the children. I've done my best over the past eight years. In the last year or so, any intimacy felt forced, like you were trying to make amends or hide something. You said you'd never break my heart, but you did it by putting him above me, even if there was nothing physically. I saw her flinch and realized that part of the truth had reached her. There were whispers coming from Philip and the general director. They clearly did not expect such a turn. They thought they were in control of the discussion, but now they realized they were wrong. Philip asked, Can we take a short break to discuss some points? Without asking my consent, my lawyer replied, There is tea and coffee nearby. Let's get back to the discussion in 20 minutes. My lawyer asked me what I thought about the company's offer. I still had my doubts. The company has a strict moral code, and even if it was not violated, negative publicity could cause serious damage to their reputation. But this was of no use to me. There was no apology, Cheryl and Gerald still received promotions, and no compensation was offered either. I think my refusal to accept money on their first attempt meant that they would no longer try to bribe me. I could live with that. The lawyer said that the wife should be allowed to speak. I agreed it would be interesting to hear what she had to say. Only 15 minutes had passed when the other side asked to return to the discussion. Cheryl wiped her tears and sat down at the table. Something changed in her. She seemed to have gathered her courage. My lawyer asked if she wanted to say anything. She stood up and walked behind her chair. I recognized this pose she was going to give me a lecture. Well, go ahead. Darling, I'm very sorry, but I need to clarify something. I never disrespected you, but I probably didn't show you the respect you deserve, and that was my mistake. At corporate events, I allowed others to disrespect you. Not overtly, but in the way they perceived you. You've been pointing this out to me for the past few years, but I've ignored it, and it's my fault. I haven't forgotten how you supported me at university in those early years, and everything you did for me and the children over the last eight years. But I let it fade into the background while I focused on work. It was a mistake. I never forgot about our travel plans. I worked hard to secure a decent salary, pension and savings so we could start traveling sooner. But perhaps my biggest mistake is that I didn't listen to you. You warned me, I heard, but did not listen. This is not an excuse, but I was absorbed in work thinking about our future, and forgot about the present. She took a deep breath. I talked to my parents last night, or rather, they talked to me. And now I have two new holes, one for call. She stopped and continued, they pointed out to me everything that you have done for me. How you have supported me all these years. How I've been ignoring you lately. Even they noticed this and warned me. I ignored them too. I was too focused on everything going well in the future. Yes, you have photographs of me holding Gerald's hand. He told me a sad story, which, although I did not check, was most likely a lie. You saw us dancing and his hands on my back. You didn't see me put them away. Darling, it's true. She continued. I'm sorry, but I have to say this. I am innocent of adultery until you can prove that I had sex with another man or woman. I'm innocent until proven otherwise. And you can't prove it because I know, in my heart, I have never slept with anyone. Sorry, love, but infidelity cannot be listed on divorce papers. I know it doesn't matter what the lawsuit says now, but for my pride I can't let that happen. She looked into my eyes. The award ceremony, where, as I said, spouses were not allowed in, that was a lie. Gerald told me this, and I had no reason not to believe him until I got there. It took me a while to understand what had happened, and then I realized that he was most likely setting it all up to try to get me into bed. I can't be sure, but I feel like he did it. He hasn't done anything for the past two years, so I felt safe around him. The photos you saw were taken at the beginning of the evening. If the hotel has CCTV footage, you'll see that I went into my room at 9.30 and didn't come out until 8 o'clock. No one came in or out. I don't know if these notes have survived, but I asked Philip to try to find them. She added, I admit that I could have done much better. 
I remember how you showed me motorhomes with new gadgets. This was supposed to be our little mobile family. She took a deep breath. This is personal, but yes, sex really was fault sex, because I realized that I wasn't paying enough attention to you. But to be honest, sometimes I just didn't have the strength or desire, so I tried to compensate when I could. I'm sorry I'm talking about this publicly. And finally, I don't want to get a divorce. It was as if her strength had left her, and she seemed to sag in place. Why didn't you just tell me he lied? What were you hiding? If you had been honest with me and told me he was lying, most of this shit wouldn't have happened. What did you want to hide? He was starting to get lost. His face was getting redder, besides the bruise, which had already turned purple. Were you hoping to have sex with her? Were you going to snoop on something or blackmail? No, of course not, he replied indignantly. Okay, then why did you lie to her? I just wanted her to accept some of my ideas. It was something new. He was clearly getting out of it. As I already said, this did not require meeting in an expensive hotel. You could discuss it at work, in your office, or in hers. This is nonsense. I didn't want us to be distracted. It disrupts our train of thought. And music and dancing, of course, don't disrupt your train of thought. He just muttered incoherently in response. Or did you want to steal her ideas? Decided that a hotel without witnesses is the best place for this. No, it was just a conversation about general ideas. A conversation in which you hold her hands, dance in your arms and grab her ass. You can't do that at work, right? I just wanted to be friendly. He felt like he was being driven into a corner. So, from the exchange of ideas to friendly ass-grabbing. She is not from our company. She has a fresh look. She is unique and has amazing ideas. And you wanted to steal them. No, you can't do that. He looked confused. At this point, the CEO intervened. Actually, this happens. You just have to avoid getting caught. And you got caught. I spoke to her team. You haven't come up with anything original in recent years. The entire last campaign was mainly the work of Cheryl and her two boys. Nothing constructive from you. His face turned crimson. Everyone in the room already knew the real reason why he lied to her. All that was left was to get him to admit it. So the real reason you lied to her was because you wanted to have sex with her, right? No, he answered quietly. You wanted to have sex with her, didn't you? asked the general director. Yes, he whispered. And you lied to her so you could be alone with her and try to have sex with her, I added. Yes, he shouted again. Who wouldn't want to? She's sexy, smart, intelligent, everything my boring, old-fashioned woman is not. And she's married to a boring guy like you who sits in the office and writes things that are interesting to no one. I noticed Philip's face turned red and purple, he had clearly lost the argument. So you lied to her so you could take her away and try to have sex with her. Yes, for God's sake, yes. Who wouldn't? He shouted again. And then, it seemed, he realized what he had just said. I turned to Philip. This is already sexual harassment. I think allegations of a toxic work environment and sexual harassment are back on the agenda, don't they? His face was still red, but he was not looking at me but at Gerald. Then he did something I didn't expect. He turned to Gerald and said quietly, Your wife is the daughter of my best friend. Gerald seemed to have just realized what he had admitted. Cheryl just sat there and looked at him with disgust. She guessed what he wanted, but hearing it was a completely different matter. Then she began to speak. You told me that I should praise you, and it would look good for both of us if I acknowledged your help. You said mentioning Harold would humiliate you. Yes, you helped me and I appreciate it, but it was just a means to an end, wasn't it? You wanted to look good, and now it turns out you wanted to steal my ideas. He just nodded. I looked at the CEO and Philip. May I suggest checking his background to see if there are any previous sexual assault cases against him? I looked at my lawyer and asked, Is it possible to lift the injunction? He replied, Yes, you both just need to sign this agreement. I will register it with the court immediately. It will take 24 hours to be approved. He took out a draft document that he had prepared in advance 
since we hoped that everything would go that way. The room became quiet, as if no one knew what to do next. As we sat, I said to Cheryl, the person who brought you the envelopes had two, one light brown with divorce papers and a red one. If you had acknowledged my help and not this idiot, he would have given you the red envelope. With these words, I pulled out a red envelope from my pocket and put it on the table. Cheryl opened it and found two tickets for a Caribbean cruise in three months. They said, cancelled. She burst into tears. The faces around the table were stunned, but for me the meeting was over. As we stood up to leave, Cheryl addressed my lawyer. Can I hug him? I need to feel it again. I don't see any problem if Harold doesn't mind, he replied. I held out my hands to her, and she rushed towards me. She pressed her face to my ear and whispered, I love you, I'm so sorry, but now I am left without work. Can you book these tickets again? I'll think about what can be done, I replied. We pulled away and they left. Then I noticed that Gerald was no longer there. My lawyer shook my hand and said, I take it you don't want to get a divorce anymore. I nodded and added, and I'm not going to file a lawsuit against the company. Let them deal with their own dirt. He continued, By the way, they offered to pay for my services as compensation to you. But I need to be careful. I don't want it to look like I'm supporting one side. Now that the situation has been resolved, I think this is not a problem. Do you agree? I smiled at him. Now that I'm not selling the house, this is a good idea. We did not wait for the court's decision. Cheryl returned home and climbed into bed with me as soon as it got dark. I had to ask her to stop apologizing, and I made her promise to listen to my warnings in the future. It took less time than I expected. On Thursday afternoon, Philip called me and invited me to lunch the next day. I was invited to meet Dennis, the CEO, and Philip at a restaurant across town. I decided that this place had been chosen away from prying eyes. The lunch was great, especially since I didn't pay for it. Dennis didn't beat around the bush. It didn't take us long to do a quick check on Gerald's background. There is nothing concrete yet, but he hid everything well. However, there is enough material to launch a full investigation into whether he harassed or attempted to seduce women. But the board of directors has already made a decision. He will be fired for what he did to your wife. Lying, trying to lure her into bed, and stealing her ideas. We recorded the interview and your lawyer received a copy. He paused. Now we have a problem. There is no one to manage this department and complete a major project. The company could lose millions. We want to promote Cheryl to Gerald's position so that she can complete the project without the temporary promotions. We have a plan to appoint Julie to her current position. A lot depends on this. If she succeeds, she will be able to choose her own working hours and tasks. This is a little strange, but we decided to discuss it with you. We want to enlist your support to convince her to stay and finish the project. I asked, what if she refuses? Then we'll have to cut staff, maybe eliminate a team or two, he replied, raising his hand. This is not a threat. We are not talking about Cheryl's team. There are others who are less successful. Of course it was a threat, I replied. The decision is hers. We'll discuss it, but I'll let her know how I feel. Dennis asked, so that we can plan, may I know what your feelings are? You can ask, but don't expect an answer. I smiled to tease them. We began to communicate in a friendly tone. We left on a good note. Cheryl returned home early in the evening. As usual, I prepared dinner. I didn't feel like eating, so I helped myself to a small portion. She noticed this and asked what was the matter. I replied that I had lunch with Dennis and Philip. She raised an eyebrow at me, calling them by name, but didn't say anything. The kids chatted animatedly about school and other little things, and we just listened. When the kids went to bed, I brought us both a glass of drink. She asked me to sit next to her to talk. Cheryl sat close, took my hand, and spoke. I thought about it. Gerald left, but someone has to lead the project. Julie is good, but she is not yet ready to take on such responsibility. I have the knowledge and experience to complete this contract. This will provide income for several teams for a couple of years. I know I handed in my resignation, 
but I think they'll take me back. I opened my mouth to answer, but she immediately leaned over and kissed me. It was a strange kiss. I barely had time to close my lips before she got her way. Please let me finish. I nodded. I want to finish the project and then find something with less work and less responsibility. I don't promise to get home on time every night, but I promise to try. On Fridays, I will finish work at noon so I can rest and be ready for the weekend. No work on weekends. But you should also stop working on weekends doing reports. After the project is completed, we will sit down and decide what we want next. Finally, you will have veto power over any invitations to conferences or parties. But if I have to go to a meeting, I want you to come with me. I have already agreed with our parents that they will look after the children if necessary. I hope we can go back to the way we used to do presentations before Gerald came along. I had already decided to give her the right to choose, but if something didn't suit me, I would have expressed my objections. How she reacts to them would determine our future. But everything she suggested seemed right to me, even better than I could have offered myself. I was about to tell her what Dennis and Philip said, but she spoke again. I want to go shopping this weekend together. Oh, damn. I agreed with your parents that they will look after the children while we look at motorhomes. Why wait? We need to learn how to handle such transport before we travel around Europe. I was stunned. Why didn't I think about this myself? She looked down at her lap, then looked back at me. I saved a little every month for several years. True, the last two or three years have been shorter, but we still managed to collect something. With interest included, we have enough for half the cost of a three-year-old, four-birth motorhome, or a decent down payment on a larger one without touching our main savings. Crap. Now how can I tell her that I have enough money to buy a new, expensive motorhome? You'll have to figure out how to present it. We spent the weekend exploring motorhomes. We learned a lot by talking to people. We even got to test one of the beds a little. If you know what I mean. Everything was quick, but the risk of being caught added spice. We've learned how hard these machines rock when you're busy. We ended up choosing a mid-size four-birth motorhome that was three years old and paid for it in cash. I admitted to Cheryl that I had money saved from trading on the stock exchange, but did not say how much. Everything was going well for us. Cheryl signed a contract for a three-year advertising campaign with the possibility of an extension if everything goes well. After discussions, she remained with the company. She reduced her work hours as promised and worked from home more often, which turned out to be very convenient. Susie got married, Derek enjoyed his single life, and often offered to look after the house. We retired when I turned 55, not her. We gained enough experience traveling around the UK in a motorhome to later buy an even better one for our trips around Europe. This motorhome was equipped with a spacious shower. We bought a small Fiat to carry around. In the summer, we spent time with our family traveling around the UK, and when autumn came and it got cold, we headed south. Sometimes we returned home for the birth of grandchildren or weddings. Life was the way it should be. As for Gerald, sexual intrigue is a widely known phenomenon in the advertising business. Stealing ideas is also an acceptable practice if you don't get caught. But getting caught stealing is a huge failure. Gerald will never be able to work in this industry again. His intentions towards Cheryl were conveyed from Philip to his wife, who filed for divorce. However, she hired a good lawyer and stripped him to the skin. Gerald was left with a routine job, without a home and family. I thought about physical violence, but decided that this would not fit into our plans, because I could be caught and prison did not suit me. That's how it ended. Christina she walked into the house with Jane, our nanny, and was surprised to see me in jeans and a t-shirt. She expected me to be dressed in a suit, ready for an award ceremony in her company. We knew she was shortlisted for an award, but we didn't know which one. She was at the hotel getting everything ready and picked up Jane on the way home. I began to suspect something a long time ago and drew certain conclusions, but last night, after a very pleasant and relaxed sex, she said, You know that I love you, right? Why didn't she just say, I love you? 
and why did she need confirmation by asking, really? To me, it sounded like she had already done something or was about to do something that I wouldn't like. I had been to her corporate events before and didn't want to go again. It will be full of managers and office employees, and workers from production are not even invited. Honestly, I just wanted to stay home, sit in front of the fire, watch crap on TV, and drink beer. I'd had a rough week with the kids and work, and I just wanted to relax and not be surrounded by the pretentious braggarts she works with, especially her boss, Ralph. In fact, I suspected that there might be something between them, and I had reasons for such thoughts. I put the children to bed. What the hell? She began, but noticing that Jane was standing nearby, she softened her speech. You should have gotten ready. I'll need a bathroom. We won't be able to share it. I won't go. You can take Jane on the way there. I'll still pay her for the whole night. Why don't you go? Please, you need to come. I'll probably get an award, and it will be weird if my husband isn't there. To be humiliated again. At the summer picnic, you didn't talk to me at all all day. You hung out with your co-workers and spent more time with your boss than with me. And I had to look after the kids while watching you flirt. I received mocking looks from Ralph and pitying looks from almost everyone else. But at least they looked at me and you completely ignored me. I won't go. But dear, when you explained this to me, I did everything to make amends and promised that this would not happen again. And I kept my word. I got up. But I don't have to explain this to you. You ignore me and then think that three weeks of sex will make up for all the times you ignored me, left me at home with the kids, and let your co-workers make fun of me for not making much money. To be fair, she was really trying to make amends. Her care, attention, and sex were fantastic. But this lasted only three weeks, after which everything returned to its previous state. The new normal was better than the old one, but still not what I wanted it to be. She rarely made the same mistakes again, but I didn't have to explain what was wrong every time. She worked at the company's head office, but they had branches all over the UK and even a few small offices in Europe. They resolved most of the issues via the internet, but sometimes she had to travel to large branches to resolve issues. In the last couple of months, she has been away for a few days for meetings or conferences. On her last trip to the conference, she didn't even call to say she had arrived. I called her myself in the evening, but did not receive an answer. I had to call again the next day to find out where she was. She said she was so busy with the conference that she forgot. At that moment, I told her that her work seemed to be more important than her family. She apologized again and tried to make amends to all of us, especially the children. She looked at me with a serious expression on her face. Honey, please, I need you there. If I get even the lowest reward, it will be 2,000 pounds. I'll take us all on vacation to make up for it. But please support me. She looked back and Jane had disappeared, probably to avoid a family dispute or to check on her bed, since she was staying with us for the night. Cheryl came up to me, hugged me, and, looking into my eyes, said, I promise I won't humiliate you, and I'll arrange for Mom and Dad to take the kids for the weekend. And we'll spend it doing those special things you love corsets, ropes, and all that. I let her know that I was giving up. In fact, I just wanted to alarm her, because it was all starting to irritate me. This ceremony will go one of two ways. Okay, I'll go, but if you ever humiliate me, I'll make such a scene when I leave that you won't be able to show up there without being laughed at and I don't care how much the prize is. She kissed me and said, Well, let's go get ready. She didn't even seem to notice that I was already shaved and showered. I went into the bedroom, started putting on my suit, and then went downstairs and talked to Jane. When Christina came down the stairs, Jane gasped, and so did I. She looked amazing, her hair was styled in a stylish updo, and she was wearing a red satin dress that I had never seen before. It fit like a glove and accentuated her figure with a mid-thigh slit. I was sure she was wearing stockings. I just hoped it was all for me. We were a little late arriving at the hotel. As we walked arm in arm, I reminded her, Just one humiliation and I'm leaving. I understand, she said, 
but even at that moment she was already looking around the room. I put my hand in the inside pocket of my jacket, checking that the envelopes were there. He looked around and saw her team and boss standing together. I also noticed one of my friends whom I asked to come. He looked like a security guard, which was good, because that was his job, but not in this hotel. Her boss, Ralph, saw us and immediately headed towards us. As always, he ignored me, kissed Christina on the cheek, and told her, You look fantastic. I freed Christina's hand, turned around and walked towards the exit. It took less than two minutes he managed to humiliate me in front of her colleagues. I noticed out of the corner of my eye that my actions attracted attention. People parted to give me away. I felt someone grab my hand, it was Christina. I didn't do anything, it's not my fault. No, but you didn't stop him. Please come back, give me another chance. I let her take me back. We approached Ralph and she said to him, Ralph, that was extremely rude. If you don't respect my husband, our relationship won't go any further. What the hell is she talking about? What is our relationship? I didn't get a chance to ask her that question because he reached out and apologized, saying he was just glad to see Christina. I didn't shake his hand. There was an awkward pause. Everyone was watching us. I'm sure a lot of people thought there was going to be a surprise show tonight. And it was. I prepared, but didn't tell anyone about it. He turned and walked away, but I'm sure he was grinning. I think he thought he had outsmarted me. I wasn't so sure. We'll see by the end of the evening. Ralph was Christina's boss, the head of the administrative department of a large international engineering company, and Christina was his deputy in charge of accounting. Over the past two years, she has brought this department from a state of chaos to one of the most efficient. I was aware of everything. She kept me informed and often asked for advice. Ralph's name was mentioned too often for my peace of mind, and the fact that he's tall, strong, and good-looking didn't help either. If I mentioned anything, she just waved it off. There were rumors that she might be promoted to take over the Human Resources Department, which also needed improvement. Christina asked to speak to the team, promising it would take no more than five minutes, and suggested that I buy drinks while she was gone. It would be natural for her to interact with her people. I looked around, Ralph was in another group among the leadership. I stood at the bar and waited to be served, but continued to watch her. She actually went to her people and stood on the opposite side of the crowd, looking at me from time to time and smiling. Ralph walked up to her and whispered something. She looked at him, shook her head, and then looked at me. This time she didn't smile. She could see that I was watching her, and I simply nodded towards the exit. She separated from her team and walked towards me. At that moment the bell rang and we were invited to the tables. She waved her hand at me. I noticed that we were seated at a table next to the big shots. At this table sat the owner of the company, the CEO, the CFO, their wives, and the owner's personal assistant. She was a tall, elegant woman in a sparkling purple dress who seemed to be directing the entire event from the head table. But other than the lady in purple, I still didn't understand which one was which. I walked up to our table and wanted to sit next to Christina, but it turned out that she was already sitting next to Ralph. I was placed on the other side of the table. On the other side of Ralph sat his wife, a small, modest, mousy woman, but in a bright yellow dress, as if she was trying to compensate for her modest features with bright colors. I was almost pleased, but didn't show it. Ralph most likely would not dare to start something in front of his wife, especially in the presence of the owner of the company. He was known for his strict morals, but this meant that if something happened, they simply knew how to hide it. I was still standing behind the chair that had been assigned to me. Christina looked at me across the table and mouthed, Sorry, this is not my idea. I was annoyed that they put me where I was, but it suited my plans, so I decided not to make a fuss. However, I looked at Christina, shook my head, pointed my thumb towards the door, and began to walk away. She talked to Ralph. He got up, walked around the table, and caught up with me. Approaching, he extended his hand. This time I shook it. Sorry about this, a little confusion, but nothing can be fixed now. 
His face didn't match the words he was saying. Of course, it was possible to fix it, but he was not going to do anything. He tried to squeeze my hand, obviously intending to show his strength. He chose the wrong person for such a stunt. He wanted to humiliate me in front of my wife and his colleagues. He wanted to show how strong he was. I leaned forward slightly, pretending to be in pain. It was painful, but I survived. Then I said loud enough for others to hear, Obviously, you are stronger than me. There is no need to prove it. But if you continue this childish display of strength, I will knee you until you look like a hamster. This will be an act of self-defense. He immediately released my hand. I wanted to put it under my arm so that the pain would subside, but I restrained myself. He just looked at it, shook it slightly, and said, Mm. After that I returned to my chair, leaving it standing. He even used his bad arm to push the chair back. This was humiliation. People deliberately turned away so as not to look at us. We sat down and the first course was brought. I tried to talk to the two men sitting on either side of me. They were polite, but did not seek to communicate. If Christina hadn't looked at me and smiled from time to time, I would have left already. At some point, I still got up. Although the waiters brought drinks, it took too long. While we were waiting for the main course, I got up and headed towards the exit. The plan was to turn to the bar at the last minute. I wanted a pint of Guinness. Since there was no proper beer, Guinness would do. It was normal. Not even a minute had passed before Christina caught up with me. Please, honey, stay. This has nothing to do with me. He just wants to be there to show me that he supports me. People saw that I wasn't sitting next to my wife, and I'm sure some of them wondered how I would react. I think some people already saw what happened, including the handshake. The head table had a clear view of what was happening, they probably heard it all. I thought it was my job to support you, not your lover, I said loud enough for people around me to hear my words. This attracted several curious glances. She leaned closer and whispered, He is not my lover. He is here with his wife. You forget where I sit. He talks to you more than to her. She is as humiliated as I am. But she seems to have gotten used to it and tolerates it. And I'm not going to. If you want me to come back, kiss me. A smile appeared on her face. She came closer and kissed my cheek. Only on the cheek. I turned around and walked towards the door and this time I was actually going to go out. I didn't even have time to take a couple of steps before she grabbed my hand again. I turned around. What's wrong? I kissed you. I quietly said, No, you gave me a routine peck on the cheek, without love, without warmth, and everyone saw how false it was. People tried not to look, but I saw their sidelong glances. I noticed how the lights lit up in her eyes. She came closer, put her arm around my neck and whispered in my ear, Sorry, darling, it will still be just a kiss on the cheek, but with a big, long hug. Is that okay? I hugged her back. This is even better than a kiss, thank you. Now, in front of everyone, I made it clear who was really in charge in our marriage. I continued to the bar and ordered a glass of white wine for Christina and a pint of Guinness for myself. Returning to the table, I placed the glass next to her plate and, in front of everyone, including the head table, kissed her on the cheek. I'm not sure, but I felt like people started looking at me a little differently. Maybe I no longer looked like the wimp who plays with the kids on picnics while his wife spends time with the team and her boss. So far, Christina hadn't done anything wrong, and frankly, I needed the evening to continue as normal. I would have just endured everything but now it looked much more impressive. Despite this, no one spoke to me at the table. It seemed like people knew something that I didn't, so I sat there, lost in my thoughts. I was sure that something was going on between Christina and her boss, although I could not find evidence. Most likely, they hid it well. Coldness in the bedroom, and then sudden bursts of passion. She was moving up the career ladder, and I stayed at home, taking care of the children. When we met, I had just finished my apprenticeship and started working as an aircraft mechanic. She studied at the university at the Faculty of Media and Psychology. We literally ran into each other in the pub. 
She accidentally pushed me and I spilled my drink. She apologized, bought me a new one, and we started talking. We immediately found a common language. We had a lot in common, but enough differences to keep our interest in each other alive. A year and a half later, we got married. She was still studying, and I was working to support her. We lived modestly but happily. When she became pregnant, we decided that her career prospects were higher than mine. After the birth of our son Gary, I became a stay-at-home mom and started working as a technical writer on the side so I could have a flexible schedule. A year later, our daughter Linda was born. We were happy, and despite her rapid career growth, we spent time together on weekends. We made plans for the future. By the age of 55, we would have saved enough to move south, buy a camper van and travel around Britain, Europe, and also go on a couple of cruises. I dreamed of the Caribbean. But for nine months now, I have felt that everything is going wrong. Constant delays at work, coldness in relationships. She explained this by fatigue, asked not to worry, and said that she was doing this for our sake. I tried to revive our relationship. I arranged dates, gave flowers, organized weekends without children. This helped for a while, but at home everything again became the same as before. One day, in a fit of anger, I told her that I felt unnecessary and sex had become a duty for her. She asked to be patient a little longer, but I decided that I wouldn't wait any longer. Today is my deadline. I looked at her across the table as the winners were announced. She didn't get fourth, third, or second place. I couldn't tell if she was nervous about getting first place or upset that she wouldn't get anything. But Ralph looked pleased he seemed to know how it would end and then she was declared the winner. The prize is 6,000 pounds. This is a good amount for a vacation. She stood up, walked onto the stage, and accepted the award. I knew she had a short acceptance speech prepared, but her words on stage stunned me. This award is not only mine, but that of my entire team. The next round of drinks is at my expense, she said. There was light applause at her table. She then continued, but I couldn't have done this without the support of someone very important to me. I tensed up, my heart filled with hope that she meant me, but she pointed to Ralph standing next to her. Without his help, I would not have achieved half of what I have achieved. These words were not in the speech I had seen before. I waited for her to add something else, but she didn't say anything. The two of them were about to leave the stage. I was furious. Everything I went through for her, giving up a job I loved, sleepless nights to support her studies, time spent becoming a tech writer. It all seemed worthwhile before, but the last two years, and especially this last year, have not been like that. I stood up from my seat and began to applaud loudly, slowly. Her face turned pale and showed shock, as if she had forgotten that I was even here. Ralph just smiled at me. I nodded to my friend. He got up on stage, approached Christina, and said loudly, Your husband asked me to give this to you. I thought she was about to faint. The room was deathly silent as she opened the envelope, and you guessed it right, it was divorce papers. They talked about treason, although I had no evidence. I took another envelope from my pocket and handed it to Ralph's wife, and then headed to the main table, where the CEO and his entourage sat. I pulled out enlarged photographs of what I had discovered and threw them on the table. I'm sure someone will pick them up and take a look. I didn't care who it was, it seemed the miss in the sparkly purple dress was reaching out to them. They will see how my wife dances in an embrace with Ralph, hanging on his neck, how they hold hands. They will see them walking down the corridor with his hand on her waist, heading towards the rooms. Then I placed another envelope on the table and Miss in the purple dress reached for it again. Everyone around me looked at me in bewilderment, except her. She was busy reading the contents of the envelope. I loved my wife, I always have, but I couldn't stand her choosing this idiot over me and doing it so publicly. I have already contacted a lawyer. I knew I would get custody of the kids, probably the house, and she would be required to pay child support. I didn't want this, but I couldn't stand the humiliation anymore. Then I turned to the crowd and said loudly, If you don't know who I am, it's because I'm never introduced. Most of you don't even know my name. 
a man in front of me answered. Well, we know. This is Rick. He tried to make an accent, and he succeeded. I ignored him. I'm her husband. But most of you probably don't know this, and you probably don't know that I take care of our two children so that she can come here and work for you, solve your problems. I helped her study at university while I worked days and nights in the cold, wet and dark to earn money while she did low-paid jobs learning her skills. She has a talent for management. I know my job isn't as high-paying as hers, but someone has to write the technical documentation so that the planes that take you around the world on your luxury vacations work properly. But now I see that I am not the most important person in her life. I pointed to her. She stood here and said that a man she had known for less than two years was important to her. For twelve years I supported her, loved her, provided her with everything she needed. She came home to a clean house where dinner was already ready. I took care of the kids, the house, the cars, all while working a full-time job, and they don't even mention me. It seems like he's more important to her than me, so I think it's time to end this farce. I looked at the stage and said, I hope you're happy with your new boyfriend. I hope he will support you as much as I did. Oh yes, that's right, he's married. With these words, I ran out of strength. I headed towards the bar. I needed a beer before I went home. When I got to the bar, I decided to order a gin and tonic instead of a beer. I told the bartender to make it strong on gin, weak on tonic, and add just one piece of ice. I didn't want to dilute the drink. I told him to put it on the boss's account. The bartender smiled at me. The room was still silent, except for my wife on stage crying. Ralph hugged her. I shouted from the bar. Don't they look cozy together? An oppressive silence hung in the room again. I noticed that those who had previously agreed with her words were now silent. I downed the gin and tonic in one gulp and headed out when I heard a loud shout. Nuo, I tried not to turn around, but I knew I couldn't help myself. And I actually stopped. She ran across the dance floor. Her face showed anger, probably because I had put her in an awkward position and she might lose her job. Well, damn it, I didn't care. No, please wait. I love you. Please wait. I loved this woman, but now it was all over. She made a choice. I froze, and she caught up with me and grabbed my hand. Please give me one minute. Just 60 seconds, please, I love you. After 12 years, 60 seconds won't hurt me, I answered. I nodded, and to my surprise, I felt her grab my hand and drag me to the dance floor. I resisted, standing on the edge, afraid of further humiliation. We returned to the table I had just left. My glass of beer was still there, barely touched. She turned to me. Please trust me. Give me one good reason to do it. Please, I love you. No, I'm not sure about that, not after what I just saw and heard. She looked at me with that same determination that I knew so well. Please, sixty seconds. I hesitated. She picked up the envelope, looking at me through her tears, and said loudly so that everyone could hear, I have done things that I am ashamed of, but I have never done what you accuse me of. Prove it, but what I see on his face says otherwise. I pointed to Ralph, who was standing behind her. Why so close? But what I really noticed was the woman in the yellow dress next to him. Maybe it was all innocent. But my comment wiped the smug grin off Ralph's face, and a look of confusion appeared on the woman in yellow's face. Then I realized that I didn't even know her name. She had never been introduced to me either. I couldn't believe that Ralph was so stupid as to keep that smug like the cat that ate sour cream smile on his face in front of his boss and his wife. Judging by the expression on his wife's face, she also recognized this smile. She threw such glances at him that if a look could kill, he would have already fallen dead, but he did not notice it. Christine looked down and said quietly, I can't prove it. She looked me straight in the eyes again. Trust me, I never cheated on you, neither physically nor emotionally. There was something in her eyes that almost made me believe her. But then I showed her a photo of her on the dance floor with her arm around Ralph's neck and her head resting on his shoulder. This suggests the opposite. With unprecedented rage, which I had not seen in her for a long time, she blurted out. I held him, 
but in my thoughts I saw and felt you. I imagined that it was you hugging me. It was the only way to get through this. I'm sorry. I began to believe her, but I was not going to back down. Is that what you told yourself when you were in bed with him? Did you imagine that it was me and justify yourself with this? No, because this never happened. She turned to Ralph. Tell him the truth, or I will. Ralph looked like he didn't hear anything that was happening. He was probably focused on my angry glare and the clenched fists at my sides, hoping they would stay there. Or maybe he was hoping I'd start a fight first. No, she didn't, he said. I wanted to, but she refused. And only after these words did he seem to understand where he was and what he had said. The realization probably came after his wife threw the contents of a glass of beer in his face. I usually think that beer is too valuable a drink to waste, but in this case it was justified. Christine turned to me. Please give me one minute. I beg you. Sixty seconds in twelve years. I looked at my watch. Time has passed. She turned and ran, almost knocking over the short, stocky man standing behind her. In his hands was a light brown envelope. She ran towards the small group of musicians on stage. Please, as we rehearsed, she said. Did you rehearse? I thought. Christine took the microphone and, turning to the audience, said, I was going to do this later, but now it is necessary. And suddenly the first notes of a familiar song sounded, which I had not heard for many years. Apart from the soft melody of the music, there was silence in the room. Christine was the center of attention. She pointed at me and began to sing. Did I ever tell you that you are my hero? No, this is not that line, it appears later. Must have been cold there in my shadow. To never have sunlight on your face. Her voice sounded uncertain. She sang through tears. She was looking straight at me. Sorry, it sounded better when I was rehearsing. She looked around the room and continued speaking. When Ralph asked me to publicly thank him on Wednesday for the help he gave me, he said it would be good for both of us. I then realized that, yes, Ralph had been helping me for the last two years. But when he asked me not to mention my husband, I realized how much this man. She pointed at me. How much this man standing here has helped me over the past twelve years and more. Without his help, support, and love, I could not have achieved anything. And I never gave him enough credit. This must end. She wiped away a tear with the back of her hand. Music played in the background, quietly emphasizing the moment. Let me tell you about my man. He was an aeronautical engineer, an excellent specialist who loved his work. But we quickly realized that in the long run, I could earn more as a manager. Then Gary showed up. Before he was born, we discussed for a long time what to do. My husband worked shifts and was often freezing in the rain and cold, but he loved his job. I worked in an office and earned significantly more. We decided that he would find a job that would allow him to work from home and take care of the child. After efforts, he qualified as a technical writer. He became a technical writer, a good one, but it was not his favorite job. It was the job that paid the bills in those early days when I was trying to get a foothold in my profession. Her voice sounded more confident. She started singing again. I was the one with all the glory. You were the one with all the strength. She stopped crying, but her face expressed deep pain. He took care of the children, the house, the cars, cooked dinners, supported me in my career, and I took it for granted. Now I understand that I was wrong. I came here to make it up to you all. She turned to the musicians again, and they increased the accompaniment. Christine continued singing, looking straight at me. Did you ever know that you're my hero? You're everything I wish I could be. She stopped, took a deep breath, and, looking into the hall again, said, I remember our tenth wedding anniversary. That evening we all worked late to fix one big mistake. Afterwards we went for a drink, celebrating that we had saved the company from huge losses. When I returned home a little after ten, he was sitting at the table, my favorite dinner was already waiting. The candles are almost burnt out. He heated up my dinner, poured me a glass of wine, and we spent the evening as if nothing had happened. I loved him that night. Very. But I still can't forget the pain on his face. She still haunts me. 
I tried to atone for my guilt then, and since then I have never allowed this to happen again. But it seems like I'm always compensating him for something, and I will continue to do this as long as he allows me. Her voice wavered. She looked at me, then back at the crowd. I knew I was hurting him. I thought he was putting up with it because he saw light at the end of the tunnel. But I didn't realize how much until he gave it to me. She waved the envelope in her hand. I'm sorry, dear. I never meant to hurt you. She pointed at me again, this time more firmly. This man is my hero. He supports me, takes care of me and our children. He is the wind beneath our wings. She signaled to the musicians, and the melody began to sound again. She slowly came down from the stage, crossed the dance floor, came up to me, and took my hand. She said quietly, Come on, let me finish. She pulled me onto the dance floor. This time I didn't resist. She hugged me around the waist, raised the microphone, and addressed the musicians again. Come on, gentlemen, with all your heart. And she began to sing the last lines. It might have appeared to go unnoticed, but I've got it all here in my heart. I want you to know I know the truth, of course I know it. I would be nothing without you. At these words, she took a step back, raised her hand, and, pointing her finger directly at me, chanted forcefully, I would be nothing without you. Her eyes filled with tears again. I came closer and hugged her. She continued to sing. Did you ever know that you're my hero? You're everything I wish I could be. I can fly higher than an eagle. For you are the wind beneath my wings. Her voice trembled and she fell silent, but continued to look into my eyes. We both cried. Our tears flowed down our cheeks, mixing. I leaned down to kiss her. Applause rang out around us and grew louder. Some even whistled. I kissed her and we hugged tighter. After that, I realized it was time to go home. But there was one more point that needed to be completed. She was still holding the envelope with my divorce papers in her hands. I took it, tore it into small pieces, and threw them into the air. They slowly fell around us like confetti. Amid applause, we headed for the exit. Suddenly, a tall, elegant woman in a sparkling purple dress appeared in front of us. If you don't mind, Mr. Phelps would like to speak with both of you, she said with a polite but firm intonation. I looked at Christine, and she nodded slightly. Manners are worthless, I answered, and we followed the woman. We were seated at the main table. There was a fresh mug of beer in front of me and a glass of white wine in front of Christine. Mr. Phelps looked at us and said, Kristen, Ryan, I'm in trouble. He turned to Christine. Christine, I want you to stay in the company. I like your work and your professional qualities, but I also understand where Ryan is coming from. He picked up the envelope I had given him earlier from the table and tapped it lightly with his finger. This will be thoroughly investigated. However, in the last half hour, I realized that I would soon need a new head of the administrative department. Thank you for bringing this to my attention. He looked at Christine and spoke again. I'm impressed by your work and skills. You know how to manage people and processes, but I didn't know how much support you received from your husband until I saw it today. He pushed the second envelope towards her. I want you to accept this job offer, but I understand that the terms of the contract may not correspond to your new way of life. Then he turned to me. Ryan, I heard that you worked with us in the past. Our technical manager speaks positively about you. I'm not sure yet, but maybe I'll offer you a job. In the meantime, you two go home and have a nice evening, Mr. Phelps added. I instructed our driver George to take you home. I believe that neither of you are ready to drive. Tomorrow at 13 o'clock George will come to your place to take one of you to pick up the car. He seemed to have thought through everything down to the smallest detail. Or perhaps it was done by an elegant woman in a purple dress. On the way home we hardly spoke. Each of us was lost in our own thoughts, still digesting the events of the evening. When we got home, I poured us a glass of whiskey. We sat on the sofa, next to each other, in silence. Christine reached out to my hand, stroked it, and, nodding slightly towards the stairs, suggested, Let's go upstairs. I stood up and led her with me to the bedroom. We undressed silently and went to bed. 
She pressed herself close to me, looked into my eyes, and whispered, Darling, I'm so sorry for the last couple of years. I could cope with others, but not with myself. I should have asked for your help. You always help me, even when I don't realize I need it. Her voice trembled and tears welled up in her eyes again. There was nothing between me and Ralph. But when he asked me to thank him publicly, I realized how little I valued your help and support. I was going to sing that song and say a few words towards the middle of the evening to thank you for everything you've done for me and through me for all these people. They should be grateful to you too. She looked at me with such tenderness that I felt the resentment melt away. You are our hero, our support, our wind under our wings. With these words, she reached out to kiss me, then settled on my shoulder. We didn't make love that night, all the emotions exhausted us. But the next day, when the children went to school, we made up for it in full. The following week, we were invited to dinner at Mr. Phelps's house. The children also came with us. The atmosphere was relaxed and several other senior managers and their families were present at lunch. Ralph was not there. After dinner, Mr. Phelps came up to us and, turning to me, said, Ryan, can I borrow your wife for a while? I promise I'm careful with my beer. He laughed a little. He took Christine to a corner of the room where they talked quietly. I didn't hear what was said, but she looked at me several times and finally smiled. When they returned, Mr. Phelps invited us to a quiet corner and, turning to me, said, Ryan, our company has two small diamond DA-42 aircraft. We use them to save time on business trips and other tasks. Our fleet manager is retiring in a year. I want to offer you this position. He paused to give me a chance to digest his words. Then he added, While you're getting the necessary licenses, why don't you also get a pilot's license? This will save on a pilot when needed. Mr. Phelps looked at me with a slight smile and said, Think about it. I've already spoken to your former employer, and they have nothing but positive things to say about you. I thought about it, but before answering, I wanted to figure out whether this offer was right for me. Mr. Phelps continued, Stop by the airfield and talk to Jeff, our current air fleet manager. He will tell you how everything works. Let me know what you think about it. Christine quietly added, I think this is a good opportunity for you. She and I discussed this proposal, and after visiting the airfield, I spoke with Jeff. He showed me the planes and shared his experiences. These were modern, reliable cars that did not require much maintenance. Jeff also suggested that I not only get my technician's license, but also my pilot's license. After much thought and discussion with Christine, I made my decision. On Friday afternoon, I walked into Mr. Phelps' office. Christine decided to accompany me. I entered his office with a serious face, trying to feign uncertainty, but he seemed to see through me immediately. I talked to Jeff. I began. I liked the proposal, but I have an idea. Mr. Phelps raised an eyebrow. Jeff suggested that, in addition to obtaining a technician's license, I should undergo training as a pilot. This will save you money on hiring pilots. Mr. Phelps smiled. If you're going to be our corporate pilot, you should just call me Roger. Christine and I looked at each other and laughed. Thus ended a difficult but important stage in our lives. It not only brought us closer, but also gave us new perspectives that we had not seen before. Our relationship has become stronger, and our respect for each other has become stronger. And as they say, it only got better from there. In the following months, our lives changed. I began training to obtain my technician's license and also began learning to become a pilot. It's amazing how quickly I got into it. Christine also made changes. She accepted a new position, but with the condition that her schedule would be more flexible so that she could spend more time with her family. Mr. Phelps, who now insisted that I call him Roger, kept his promise. The company has introduced a new code of conduct, especially regarding interactions between employees. This was a significant step forward, which I thought benefited everyone who worked there. Christine was doing a brilliant job as always, but now she had more time to be home, spend time with the kids, and just live our lives. For me, working with airplanes has given my life meaning again. When I first took the helm, nervously, 
I remembered what Christine had said to me after that memorable party. You are our hero, our wind under our wings. These words sounded in my head every time I went out to the airfield. At the end of the year, Roger invited us to another family dinner. This time it was something like a friendly meeting, informal and warm. Our children, his family, and several other company employees were there. At one point Roger came up to me with a glass of whiskey in his hand and said with a smile, You know, Ryan, I have something special for you. He pulled out a small souvenir badge with a picture of an airplane and handed it to me. Welcome to our little aviation world, he said. You're doing great. I accepted the badge and smiled. It was a simple gesture, but it meant more to me than words. Christine smiled as she watched us. She knew how much it meant to me. Our marriage, which was once on the brink of collapse, is stronger than ever. We have learned to appreciate each other and our time together more. Life sometimes throws us difficult challenges, but if there is love and respect, any obstacles can be overcome. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one. 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 Click to the next.